Hello, I am Dr. Abstract and welcome to Zim Explore. In this Explore, we're going to take a look at a survey that has been done in Zim. Ooh, and here it is. How exciting, huh? What level of JavaScript are you? Eh, I'm probably an expert. Whoosh. What level of Zim are you? Eh, I'm probably an expert. <laughs> is this why I showed you the survey? Oh, look how expert I am. <laughs> So this thing is called, why don't we reduce the sound a little bit, <laughs> says the expert. This thing is called a selector, and that's how it works. Down below, we have an indicator that is telling us which uh, page of the survey we're on. About how many things have you made with Zim? This thing's called a stepper, and it steps through numbers, but also through strings, if you so desire. And let's go to the next one. How many years have you used Zim? You can hold that down. Hold that down and move your mouse, or just hold it down and it will step through things. But the farther away you move your mouse, the faster it goes. It's really cool, especially if you have a lot of things. And remember, it can be strings, and you can put these arrows up at top and up at bottom. So how many? Well, you know what? Why don't we go take a look at that? I just, I saw, I went up and I saw this cat here. If I click on the cat, it takes us back to Zim. And so this is the main site at zimjs.com. That survey was at zimjs.com slash survey. And we'll put a link to it in, in, the, uh, in the YouTube. But if you click on the cat here and it can bring that back down, you have a bunch of new things that are available in cat. And on the right hand side, we've done another survey. So here's a survey with some different things. Uh, what are all these things called? <laughs> and you put them in order and then you do a test. Oh, I got it wrong. So this is error checking. We're error showing you how to error check in here, or you could look at, at this example to see how to error check. In the survey that we're going through now, where you're filling out things about Zim, we're not doing any error checking. Uh, but this example has it. It also shows a list. So this is called a list. This last one, by the way, that bit was called a scrambler. And uh, this is another scrambler here. And these are radio buttons. So you can use radio buttons, traditional radio buttons in Zim as well. More of these uh, steppers. So there we are having text in the stepper. And here is another selector, but this selector is in a grid. So that's pretty cool. The selector can just be along the side or can be vertical or in a grid like this. Just like your television when you're when you're trying to type something in, <laughs> searching on Google and you're using the television remote control. That's what this thing's like. That sort of said, hey, we should make one of those. And we did. So it's called a selector. Here's some radio buttons, but we put them on a slant. And this is what I was thinking of. Here is a stepper that has the arrows on the top and the bottom, and it's stepping through longer words. So you could step through that way. And again, you could just click on it and go up and down like that, and it, it will scroll through those as well. So that's a stepper. Another list. We didn't do a list in our current one, but we could. And then this is a selector that is in a grid, but it's circular. Yay! Let's do a test on that one. Do you think Dan Zen is Dr. Abstract? Hmm, test. Correct! So there's an example. We didn't submit this survey, but there's an example of uh, another survey. I thought I would show you that. And we're back here now in our main Zim survey that we're looking through for this Zim Explore. Other. How did I find Zim? Ooh, when I got to Other, I popped up a text area and I can say, well, I found Zim because I'm the founder. <laughs> it found me, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. And uh, how could we improve Zim? These are text fields or text areas. And when we go from one page to the other like that, we cache the cache what we're, we're animating. And since these are overlaid with HTML, we just remove them. <laughs> it's not the end of the world and then they fade in. But if you, if you notice that, you go, I wonder why. That's why. However, um, no problem. And in here, we start typing something and that placeholder goes away. So that's the HTML placeholder on the text area that we're looking at there. Would you attend a monthly Zoom meet? We're back to the back to the selector. Instead of a radio button, could have used radio buttons there. And then any final comments before submitting. Right. Here's the submit. Note that we're at the end of our indicator and our arrow has grayed out. There's actually one more page in here. We, we can swipe. There's me swiping between pages. 
I can't swipe to the next page because I've turned that off. And I can't arrow to the next page because I've turned that off. We're going to submit and watch. This will animate by rotating. Ready? Woo! Nice, huh? And it leaves us with a thanks and, hey, do you want a review on Facebook, which links off to Facebook. This arrow will bring us back. Watch the swipe again. Woo! Now, it was a little tricky, so we had some custom work to do with the, with the arrows because normally the arrows are going to gray out at the last page. Well, we had to gray out one page before the last page because we just didn't want you going to the next page without submitting. And watch what happens when we go back to the beginning here. We go to the beginning, and there we go. It grays out that way. So these are new. These are new to Zimcat 3. It's called an arrow class, and these are arrows. Really, it's just a button with arrows of different types. This is a thick arrow. There's also a triangle. Well, we'll take you through those. How about... Um, and it's got an event right in it that works with pages. So basically what happened is we were making this and we made our own arrows. It's, you know, I've been annoying making an arrow in the first place or making a button in the first place that's a triangle. We have to rotate the triangle. We have to make a button, set the triangle as the icon for the button, remove the label with label equals quote, quote, or, you know, label colon, quote, quote. Um, so they're icons and make a roll icon, and that's another triangle. we got to rotate it. We have to center it a little bit, too, because um, arrows are different sort of for centering. And if you put a background circle on there, for instance, we can show you that. We'd have to then shift the arrow a little bit. So not only that, but once you have the button, you've also then got to say, OK, well, we've got these pages. So how do I go to the next page? Well, that's a pages.go. But then you have to say what page that's going to be. You have to say what transition. Well, actually, it'll take a default transition. But you can say go to the right because we don't we don't know if you want to go to the right to that page or to the left of that page. So there's like a bunch of things that you have to do. It ends up being about 10 lines of code, six, six to 10 lines of code. And as we did that, we went, well, geez, you know, we've got it so that it's automatically swiping. We know how to do that. Why couldn't we hook it up to give a nice little arrow? So we've made a Zim arrow, yay, that you can use with pages, or you don't have to, and then you've got an arrow button. But it's cool if you make an arrow, uh, an arrow and you just pass in the pages object, and hey, do, is it a left arrow or a right arrow? And then it works, and it does the automatic graying out or you can say to make it disappear or do nothing, but you could make it disappear completely rather than gray. And we'll take you through the different types of buttons as well, um, or the different types of arrows. Good, why don't we do that then? Let's go take a look at the code now. Are you excited? <laughs> In this Zim Explorer, Ooh, I'm kind of excited. I wanna look through code. Yes, let's explore. Whoa, look at that, it's code. <laughs> All right, so here we are. We're bringing in Zimcat, and this is 03 this time. 03, that hasn't been launched yet, but uh, as we were working on the survey, we were adding some things to 03 that just makes our lives a little bit easier. Here we are bringing in font. We could have, if we wanted to, just taken that and thrown it right here as the only asset. If the font were in the same directory as our page, we wouldn't need any of that. We just pass what font. You can also go off to Google and get a Google font and just see the frame docs to find out how to do that. There we are bringing in a font. And here we are making that cat up top. You can make cat. You could also make icon or do a made with. Made with. And that gives you some things that come with frame. We're centering that. And when we tap on it, we go to Zim, a blank page. We have a label there. We are bringing in the font called Ruben. Remember Ruben? And we're positioning it slightly off center because the cat kind of shifts to the left. And so we've minus 20 off center there. We've made a new backing and we're going to put our pages inside this backing and mask the backing. And that makes sure that the the transitions that we're showing actually stay right within in the page. Uh, let me show you what um, I mean by that. So if we comment that out, then we see this. Watch the transitions on the top and the bottom. You see how they're slightly bigger than the page? 
they're like that because normally a page is as big as the canvas. And we don't we want the transitions to make sure they go right off the edge of the canvas. Because if you make them exactly the same size as the canvas, sometimes when you scale like this, when you scale in various ways, you see just a, a thread of light or something like that in the transitions. And it was annoying. So we made sure the transitions are bigger than the page. In this case, though, we've got a page that is the the you know, smaller. So the transitions you can see are slightly bigger than the page. So what we've decided to do was mask them. So we've thrown it into a rectangle, a backing, and then use that very same rectangle to mask itself. Which is, <laughs> how much fun is that? If the pages are in the rectangle, um, we have to make sure that we can click into the rectangle. By default, a Zim rectangle has its children turned off. Uh, because a rectangle is actually a container that holds a rectangle shape. So you can put things in there, but if you do, you have to remember to uh, let their mouse children be back. So let's show you what this means. We refresh here, and now I cannot click inside there. I can't interact with, well, I can, I can interact with the whole thing to move it, but I can't interact with the stuff inside this rectangle. Weird, huh? Well, I know what I'm doing because I've been using Zim for a while. If you do want to use a rectangle as a container, then make sure that you turn the mouse children on. So the reason I'm doing that is because I am... Oh, <laughs> did, did it work? <laughs> I could click in there. I'm an expert! Or if you're confident, you could probably do it too. But if you're a beginner and intermediate, I would not put stuff into Zim shapes because that's a tricky thing. And you don't have to, you can make your own container. I could have just made a container called uh, My Pages or something like that and thrown the rectangle and My Pages into the container. And that would have been fine. I masked the container, yay, no problem. But I decided I would um, I would sneak it all into right into the rectangle. And if you do do that, just remember to turn the mouse children back to true so that we can interact with things inside. If you have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> on this Explorer, and you're completely lost, that's one of the sort of more expert things, and you can just ignore it. Although, maybe you're working your way towards being an expert. Yeah, that's good. That's why this that's what this Explorer is all about. Let's see what we're building here, how we're doing it. What are these what are these wonderful, strange things? By the way, Mouse Children has been around since Director, back in the 90s, making CD-ROMs. It's a necessary thing. Sometimes you want to interact with the whole container, and sometimes you want to interact with its children. And Mouse Children lets you choose which one you want to do. But it's kind of like, you know, who would have thought of that? Well, the people who thought of that are the people who have been making interactive media for years. So it was available for us in Director for CD-ROMs. It was available for us in Flash. And it's available here now in the Canvas as well with CreateJS brought that into play. Yay! All right, let's go. Here we are bringing in some data. And we're going to get some information on the query string. That's what we pass into the the HTML page. So watch this. If I go question mark ID is equal to Dan Zen, like that, and hit enter, we don't really see anything here. But inside, uh, if we, let's see, we're collecting the ID from the query string, we will go zog and we'll make it green and we'll zog the ID. How about red? We'll definitely be able to see that. So here we are zogging red. We're going to zog the ID that we get from the query string. Uh, no, this is our bind, and we also have reporting turned on to true. So we're going to see a lot in the console because of the reporting. So I refresh here to see the console. That's F12. Here's the lot that's coming from the reports. But there's our red Dan Zen. Right there. Dan Zen is the ID. If we change this to Ronald Zen <laughs> and hit enter, we see 
Ronald Zen here. So what we've done with this survey is we put it into Zim Slack. That's our Slack channel. So come on by to Zim Slack if you've never seen that before. Zimjs.com slash Slack. And we've sent messages to each person in Slack and we put on there their Slack ID or, or their name that we recognize them by so that when they do the survey, they don't have to fill in their name. It'll be done for them. We're going to collect that information right here on the command line. Neat, huh? So the way we've done that is we've asked for query string, and that's just a wrapper to some JavaScript stuff that finds out what's in, I don't know, some location somewhere I can never remember how to do it. And it will divide those up because those, if we ask for the normal JavaScript way, we actually have to split it up ourselves to find out which uh, that's in CGI format. So if we pass in, it might be something like this. Let's try it. Shall we try it? ID ampersand, we would put an ampersand, um, hmm, what do we want to do next? Uh, state, I can't even type the word state, state equals Hawaii, Hawaii, there we go, and I hit enter like that. Now I don't see anything there yet because all I've done is zogged the ID, but if we zog what the query string is, or and we'll zog what color, how about yellow, and query. So what have we collected here? Let's have a look. We've collected an object that has an ID of Ronald Zen <laughs> and a state of Hawaii. Neat. So what we do, query string will automatically turn this stuff right up here. Instead of having to parse that on our own, it will turn it into an object. Now there actually may be some JavaScript way of doing that. I'm sure there's a what's that called? A jQuery way of doing it. But whatever, this is the Zim version of it, query string. And so if we wanted to, if we asked for dot state, <laughs> see, I told you I can't, I can't type the word state. Every time I, I type the word stage, I've done too many stage dot updates. And I just will automatically type the word stage, even if, if I try and type anything close. So there's query dot state. And let's have a look. Hawaii. Now we're getting the Hawaii part of that. So what we're doing here is saying, if there's a query ID, so if there's something in the ID, then use the query ID. This is the ternary operator that has three parts. The conditional, what to do if it, the conditional is true, and what to do if the conditional is false, separated by that colon. So if this is true, if there is a query ID, then you use the query ID, and that will be assigned to ID. Otherwise, assign Anon for anonymous. That's just a word we made up. Anon. So if I see a bunch of anons in there, I know that we haven't put anything on the end of the survey URL. And that's why we're receiving that data of anonymous. <laughs> Yay! Do you like this exploring? Isn't it fun? All right, so now we're to the Zimbind. Oh, it's so, so pleasant to use Zimbind to, to, to collect this data. We didn't have to, if we wanted to, we could have used async. So we've got a bunch of pages. Let's just give me, let's just give me the lay of the land. Let me just give you the lay of the land. We're gonna be applying some styles because a lot of those questions are similar. You know what I mean? We've got this text up top. We've got, we've got select selectors working. They all kind of look the same. So we're gonna make those with styles. Um, those are the styles and we'll go through those and talk about. Them. Then we have page one. So here's page one. Here is the stuff on page two. Here's the stuff on page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page 10. So like each of these is pretty well close to being the same. Page 10, page 11, the last page has some links off. They're all pretty well the, the close to being the same. And here we are adding all of those pages to the pages object. And the pages object handles swiping and going between the pages. All right, and there's us turning that, that last uh, swipe off, and we'll get to this when we get down there. There are the arrows, and then that's the indicator. So all the stuff down here is the, the interface, the pages, the arrows, and that indicator down at the bottom. All right. And otherwise, we've got each page. So despite the fact that it you know it looks uh, like a lot there, it's not really complicated. There's page one. 
So on page one, there's us binding the data. If we wanted to, though, this is a selector in, inside of page one. If we wanted to, we could have said, hey, this is page one dot selector is equal to this selector. And we could have done that with all of our other selectors and our text fields and stuff. And then down at the bottom, when we do our submitting, our submitting's on page 10. So here's page 10, there's the submit button. You see how it says it's a button and there's submit. And when we tap on that, we're going to do this stuff right here. In this stuff, we could have said, okay, let's make a new Ajax object, new Ajax. And we could have said to that Ajax where to go. That's the, the URL.php to go to the, the Ajax object. And then we can do, I can't remember, I think we put the data right on here, or there might be a, something like if this is uh, const Ajax, or a, we might have said a dot send or something. And in here we would send pay, uh, we would say something like the JavaScript, JavaScript is equal to, and we would concat onto that page one dot selector dot current value. Or I think with the selectors, we're going to text dot text. That's the text in the selector. And then we would concat onto that an ampersand uh, zim. This is our data for zim is equal to. And we would then concat onto that. Oh, uh, just in case this has, this is called CGI format. We're making a, a big long string that looks very similar to the string up top here like that. That's also CGI format. So we're just making the same kind of format where it's an ID equals a value ampersand. <laughs> Where'd I go? ID equals a value, ampersand, another ID equals a value. In case there's something, like we can't put an ampersand in here, ooh, that would be bad because then we wouldn't know where these do the splitting, for instance. So there are certain characters that have to be URL encoded, it's called, which means we would have to go dot URL encode here. I think it's all lowercase in Zim. This is a Zim sort of version of it. Yeah. No, I can't remember for sure. There we go. We would have to URL encode the data that's coming in there to make sure that it doesn't mess up with our ampersands and equal signs. So then we would add on to that a URL encoded version of page two selector, <laughs> etc. So anyway, this would then add up. There'd be 10 pages or nine pages. Uh, we have that other field. We would make this big long string of all of this stuff that we have been referencing. Okay, and that's what we would send off with Ajax. Hey, that's not too bad. And if you look at the data module, in uh, Zim School, for instance, or in the Learn JavaScript with Creative Coding, we show you how to build that stuff in, in that data module. So what we're doing now, though, is featuring Zim Bind, which is a little bit different. If we didn't have to find out about the results, oh, by the way, that Ajax would have to also find out about results, and, and we could call a callback, which looks like that. So to that Ajax that I just deleted, we would have to add this callback stuff. So if we didn't worry about the callback, because all we're really doing is submitting the form, this is what zim bind looks like, bind.2. So we don't have to make all those pairings of things, because uh, uh, we'll, we'll show you why. But anyway, um, we, do, we are going to take a look at the callback and, and say what to do. But why don't we come back and take a look at that later. So up top here, root, 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 right here, here we are making ZimBind, and we're telling ZimBind what we want to connect to. So we'd have to do that with Ajax too. We're saying, please send it via either get or post. So if we do Ajax, that's going to be um, post. If we do JSONP, which is a thing called async in Zim, we could do Zim async as well and do it with, with JSONP. Or the bind handles either. If you use get, that's JSONP. If you use post, that's that will use Ajax in behind. Cool, huh? Uh, don't use post if you're trying from local. So here we are, local. You see how it's my E drive? We're local. So uh, if we use Ajax, it won't work because of cores errors, uh, cross-resource sharing sort of uh, 
Uh, so use get get, and that uses JSON P. Uh, uses zim async in behind rather than ajax and zim async uses json p which doesn't have the same security problems <laughs> i guess security is good at times but it's annoying at other times so that's great that means you can test here without putting your stuff on the server yay using get but for our final product we would change this to post and for our final product we wouldn't do reports so this is how the survey will look when we go live it will be post and We'll have our reports turned off. But as we test here with you and take you through it, we're going to go to get, sorry, and change the reports to on like that. All right, so here's our, our PHP that we're going to. We're using get. We can pass along a master, and, and in this case, we're passing the ID. So remember when we put this people who were surveying, we put their, their username in there. So their username ends up getting passed to the server as, as a master data. And then we use that to put, put the record into the database at this ID. Yay. Uh, we also have a proper ID in there as well that's a unique ID, just in case, even, even though people's IDs should actually be unique. But uh, this is a way that we can pass extra information along with the stuff that we're sending and we've got the reports turned on. Let's just take a quick peek then at how we make sure that we're sending the right data, because this looks really easy so far. Bind, where are we binding to? Okay, and then down below we saw the end of that is just bind to. And remember, if we didn't care about what we do when we receive data back, that's what it would look like. Hey, so that's too easy. How do we know what we're sending? So here's how we know what what data we're sending. If we look at page one here, which is right here, this is page one. This is our selector. Oh, by the way, for each, if we were using Ajax, we would have to make sure that we identified each of these things. So there's the, this is page two selector. And then we get down to the stepper. Here's the stepper. And we would might say page three's stepper, etc. So we'd have to like, Put a variable name, or we could have put these in variable names. Uh, that's you know that's a little bit annoying. That would look like const stepper, and this is stepper on what page three? So maybe we'd say stepper three const stepper three, and in this one we would say const selector. This is selector on page two, so const selector two, and here we would say const uh, selector one, I guess. So for Ajax, we would have to put these all in variables so that we can, you know, remember them uh, for later to find out what their values are. But with bind, we do not have to do that. So we can go through and just, well, we would never have made these. Just go through and not have those there. Neat, huh? The reason why is take a look at our selector. There's our selector. We're centering it on the page. We're moving it and we're binding it. We're binding it with an ID called JavaScript because it relates to the JavaScript question. And the property that we're using is the text property. So basically, whatever text property in this selector will get sent off to the server as a JavaScript name and a text property, and then the value. So here is the same kind of thing. We're binding it to Zim. It's a text property. Now, note that it's not just Zim gets the answer. It's Zim's text is this answer. And the reason for that is we might have several things that we might want to bind. So for instance, if we had a new circle and we wanted to send to the database uh, the x and y of that circle, we would dot center it. We might do a dot drag on it. And then we'd say dot bind. And that bind, we would call this thing uh, our circle, or we'll call it our ball or something like that, comma. And the, the properties that we want to bind are the X property, the Y property, and its layer or level, uh, which is level. Okay, so there's a level property that tells us, is it at the bottom, zero, or at the top, the num children minus one, or any level in between, one, two, three, four, and that gets our stacking. So if we want to save a collage, it's important to save 
which height it is, like which layer it is in the collage, and that's called level. So we would bind all three of these properties to an ID, a bind ID called ball. Neat, huh? And the cool thing about this is it all gets saved as this JSON file or a JSON string, and you can just store the whole JSON string in one record. Then you can bring the whole JSON string back and recreate your collage. <laughs> you know, it's hardly anything at all to do on the database. So that's really cool. This, however, is a survey, and the survey is a little bit different. The survey, we want to store each thing separately as a separate field in the database, because we're not just bringing all that data back and recreating something. We're actually looking at that data on the database. So we don't want it to be all one big nested string. We want it to actually be different fields. So we've worked out something on the data side that will, that will handle it. Um, in other words, when we send data, we're sending it as, as Zim or JavaScript, this thing really isn't all that important. It helps us find where we get the data from, but we're not actually interested in the fact that we got it from a text field. We're only interested in that it's the answer about Zim and whatever the value in here is, not actually what, what we're getting that from. So on the, on the database side, we've got this thing called Simplify. It's in Zim Base, it's called. Zim Base is, hand, helps you handle the database stuff. And we've got this thing called Simplify, and we just simplify it. And what it does is it will give you data for that. And then the answer is the result, like what the value of that is. And it just kind of completely deletes that. It's sort of assuming that you're only sending one property per bind ID, which is what we're doing. All right, so that's a little bit about the Zim binding. And you just saw everything right there. And the amount of time that I told, well, it's not quite everything. There's filters and extra stuff. But in terms of what we're actually using here, you just saw everything. You ready? We'll go through it one more time. We're going to bind to this location, either using get or post. It doesn't matter. The server side with Zim base, we'll figure it out. That's really cool. OK, so we're, we're binding to that location. Each of the things that we're binding, we give it a bind ID. And we say what property we're wanting to pass that data along. Bind ID, property, etc. For, for each of the things that, that we're binding. And then down at the bottom, if we didn't really care about the callback, or where to go quite at the bottom, if we didn't really care about the, the callback, it would just be send off that data. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Where we're sending it to? Bind each one, send off the data. I don't think you, you'll ever see anything. I mean, maybe a view, view hopefully has binding that's, that's that simple. But that's, that's quite straightforward. And in this case, just so you know what we've done here, uh, bind has a callback function. So here's what the callback function. We're receiving a result. So this is an ES6 arrow function. We have one parameter, so we don't need the round brackets. But you might be used to the round brackets, or you might be used to the word function here with no arrow function. Same thing, that would work too. This is ES5. So a function, we're receiving the result, and we can find out if the result success is there, then we're going to page 11. So there's us using the pages go method to manually go to page 11. Uh, we're not going to say anything about the direction. Uh, we're going to use the fan this is overriding the, the, the Zim lines, or whatever lines for Zim, the, the transitions. We're using the fan transition there. Okay, so uh, that's that. And we used to have to do this stuff for every arrow. Every arrow we would make, it was pretty easy in this case, was because we've only got an arrow on the bottom. But quite often, we have a whole page, and we make the whole page animate with arrows on each page. So we'd have to put arrows on each page, and all the time those arrows would then, we'd use hotspots for that. So we had a system where we would just loop through all the pages, or no, we would loop loop through, yeah, loop through the pages, provide hotspots for all the arrows, and we could do that all in a loop. But uh, maybe we won't have to do that too much anymore because it's pretty easy now to just add arrow, add an arrow thing, pass in the page, and that avoids all of that, uh, all that work. Yay, really cool. Okay, so uh, what was I going on about? Mm, oh yeah, we used to have to add this to that uh, that loop, uh, but now now we don't anymore. However, this is a custom one that we want to go to the next page in that manner, and if there's an error, so else 
show the error. So if there's no result uh, success, so this is the result that we're receiving here. If there's no, not a success, then we're going to show the error, error. And this is the error right here. It's a pane that says error. That's all. <laughs> uh, the way I test this usually is just put a not here. If you want to see what that looks like. So if I put not here, this means I I'm, I'm saying if I'm successful, then I'm not going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do this other one instead. Here's what that looks like. So you get a sense as to what the error message looks like. Boop, 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 boop. Refreshed going through to the end. There's the submit and error. So that's what that looks like. Submit, error. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the error, by the way, if you ask for result.error, it will actually tell you the error. So you can pass back an error and uh, put it in inside of here. Right now we're just hard coding the word error, but you could quite easily get result.test and change the text of it so it would look like this kind of thing. Um, error.text is equal to uh, re result.error, like so, and then show. I think that'll work. Hopefully it, it all lines up. Uh, and by the way, if you don't want to keep on whipping through all of those pages to, to be able to submit, you could do a couple pages. One, one, thing, one thing is you could say, hey, just start with page 10. So I, I just quickly said, make the submit button the first button we see, or the first page we see. And there, there I can now test the submit right away undefined. <laughs> okay, so uh, why is that? I think because there is actually no error, right? That would make sense. So you see what we've done here. We said if there's not a success, then do this. Well, we actually do have a success, so there is no result.error. It's undefined, but that would be the code that you would use if you wanted to do that. So I'm going to just undo all this stuff now. To where? Oh, yeah. Don't need that anymore. All right. So where are we in our uh, look through all of this stuff? We've seen the binding. Oh, I was looking at the results of that just to make sure that the results weren't so scary for you. We're calling a bind to when we get the results back, we're going to the next page or we're showing an error. So that whole binding process bind to a location. Each thing that we're going to collect the data from, we bind that. We say, we say uh, what property we're going to bind. And then down here, we call a bind to. There's also binds from, so you can get data from the database. And there's a bind to from, which binds to and from. So there's a few different results there. There's callbacks. There's uh, fil these things called filters that you can look at the data before you send the data. Funny thing is, we just recently, on the selector, let's go to where we see a selector. Sorry about that. Here's a selector. We should probably look a little bit at the selector, too, because we kind of skipped over the styles and how these, how these components are made. Um, but on the selector, we bound to the text. In Zimcat 2, there was no text property. A selector had a selected, a selected, I think. Selected is the object that is selected. Because you pass in, in the selector, it's a tile. So whatever is in the tile, that's called the selected item. And this is the selected item if you select intermediate. So it would actually be this label. So we had a selected. We also had a uh, selected index like that index, which told us which one of these from an index 0, 1, 2, 3 was selected. Well, I mean, that would work. I could collect the index, but the problem is then in my data, I would have 0, 1, 2, 3 for these. And that's not as nice to see in the data. I want to see what they are. So I wanted to send the words that are inside here. And when we made the selector, which was fairly new, so we haven't had too much time to use the selector. When we made the selector, we didn't provide the text here because we had to go to the object, which is the label. And then we could ask for the selected dot text. So at that point, if, if we wanted to, or at any time right here, we could say, well, if this had a name to it, uh, const 
S, we'll call it, for the selector. We could say um, zog r s dot selected dot text, and that would give us whichever one was selected and its text property. Because you do not actually have to have labels in here. The selector can work on a bunch of shapes. So we made a code pen example where we were selecting a bunch of shapes from a bunch of shapes. And they don't have a text field, so there wouldn't be a text. So we, we, we said, okay, you know, it's not always text, so we're just going to give you the item. But when we bind, so here, here's what happened now. We, we now need to use the selector in a form, and we want to use binding. Well, we if we're binding, we only can bind a, a property of this object. We can't bind a property of a property of the object. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not nested like that. And that's something we might consider. Maybe, maybe it would be nice if we could just say selected dot text here. And by passing in this, it would actually bind to the text field of selected. But we haven't done that. Maybe we could. Hmm. Should we? Well, uh, what we decided, what we started doing is we can run a filter. So here's what the filter would look like. It's really cool. Uh, I suppose it would be probably a main filter. So we could put a filter on each one. No, I think, yeah, we could put a filter on each one, but we may as well, because we have multiple selectors here, rather than go and put a filter on this selector, put a filter on the next selector, put a, a filter on the next one, etc. What we could do is put the filter right on the two. So here's the two. Where's the two? Here's the two. What we could do is filter like this, colon, and uh, we would call a function when we filter. That function receives data, by the way, the data that's coming in. Like that, and we put a comma here. So we receive data, and we need to return the data, return data. So for the filter, it needs to receive the data that's being passed through, and then we have to continue that on, so we return it. So whatever data we're receiving, we can then process. We could say if data dot, uh, let's see, what would we want to do here? We don't know what's in the data. We'd have to loop through the data. So we would have to loop through the data, loop through data. Each time we're given um, a key and a value. And we pass that into another function here. So here we are looping through the data. And we could say if key dot type. Actually, the key is going to be the, um, what's it called? The bind ID. So the key is the bind ID. And then the, the value is going to be that key will go to yet another option. So yet another. But imagine if the key were were uh, of type. Um, let's see. The key is. The, do we have the object on? Anyway, one of these things we could say if the type is equal to a, a label like this. This won't quite work, but it's along these same lines. Then we would say uh, data at the key is equal to the um, key dot text instead. So what this is doing is it's a filter that would loop through, find out if it's a label that we're passing along as data. It's like, oh, no, 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 please don't pass the label. Please instead make the data equal to the text property, not the label itself, but the text property. And then if, if this were the right, it's, there's one more nesting in here and I can't, I can't be bothered. So this is kind of like where we backed out. We said, oh, okay, you know, it'd be nice to show you a filter, but because of the nested data that, that we do to handle multiple properties on a same object, because of those, the nested data, it's like one more level of looping and we're kind of going, ay, 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 you know, I'd rather not have to take you through that one more label of looping. But this is how filters work in general. You bring the data in, you make changes to the data, and then you return the changed data. And that gets passed right on through. It would then pass in here, like to uh, like it go to the, the, the resulting place. 
Oh, the other thing is too we'd have to deal with is if command. So we'd have to receive a command as well because this kind of makes a difference. Command like so. So we receive data, but also the command because there's a difference. Is it being passed to the server or is it the data that's coming back from the server? So the filter handles both sides. So if the command is double equal to two, so we're going to the server, then we want to apply these filters like that. Otherwise, if it's coming back from the server, we don't want to run it through the filter. Okay, so uh, when I said that's all there is to binding, it's not quite all there is to binding. It's all that we need for this example, and it's all that you would need for many examples, but binding is really powerful too with all this uh, filtering stuff. It's like quite magical. All right, so, but going back to what we're using in this case, all we're really doing is saying, where do we want to send it to? What properties do we want to send? And go ahead and send it. And when we're done, all right, the two sends it. When we're done, call that callback. Yay, let's move along, shall we? <laughs> that was quite the explore. And there has been explores already on binding. So uh, we don't need to look too, too much more at the binding. I think that's, that's it for the binding process. And what we do want to look at, though, is how we styled these, uh, the selectors and stuff like that. So what do we do with our styles? We set style, and we're saying if it's a type of label, then we're going to do this to it. We're going to make it dark. We're making it Reuben, and we're center regging it. Why are we oh center regging? Because we're tiling all of those labels, all anything that we put in a tile. Uh, on a selector, we want to center reg it because a se selector works based on I don't know kind of registration point. We want it centered on there. So, in in the documentation for a selector, it says we would recommend center regging all of the things that you put in the tile. So, there you go, and that will uh, make this stuff work nicely. Mm, uh oh. Oops, Daisy. So somewhere along the lines, we messed up. Where's that filtering? Brrrr. Bind text circle. Okay, I remember that one. Let's stop there. <laughs> Hopefully, we're good now. Brrrr. All right, uh, that'll make this kind of work out properly for you. That, that being wrapped around there like that properly. At least I think it's necessary. Let's comment it out and see what happens if we don't do that. Probably look. Oh, yeah. Okay. So look at that. Here's the registration point of, of this uh, this label right here is a registration point here. And look at that. It's stuck right on the registration point. It's like, nah, that's not, not going to work. So we decided the best way is to center reg it. However, if we're uh, if we're making labels, we don't want to add them right away. We want to let the tile do that. So we've said center reg them, but do not add them to the stage automatically. Otherwise, uh, if we said center reg true, that will just automatically center reg them on the stage. And then we go and tile them, and then things might get messed up. So that's that one. On our tile, we're saying please align things in the center, give some spacing, H, horizontal spacing, make it four columns. Some of those tiles, or at least one of them, has more than four, but we'll override that right on, just like cascading style sheets, we'll override that right on the object. Be like putting a style right on the tag we can do. And unique. I don't think I want to go too much into tiling and unique versus non-unique. Maybe just a little, but not, not too much. Here's what we're doing on the selector. So that was the tile. The selector itself has some padding and a speed set. We also could start off with no, uh, with nothing selected. The problem is there, if you look at it and choose confident, if we made this show up just unconfident, we would never get to see this beautiful selection move. <laughs> So we didn't start it off this way. If you start off this way, what it does is it just sort of shows up in the center and kind of moves off to the side. I don't know if I like that solution. That's actually new to Zimcat 3. Um, is that uh, like start in the middle? If you started at the beginning all the time and moved, it might be a little, you know, it might be just as odd. So basically the selector looks best and works best if you just start off with something selected. And so that was the, the choice that we've made. I don't think it's the end of the world if, if uh, one's showing already. 
You know what I mean? It's not the end of the world, huh? If you are a beginner, you don't have to do anything. Great. You miss, you miss your selection if you're beginners, but maybe, maybe you're going to poke around here and see what happens. I don't know. And then the stepper, we're setting to a background color of the stepper there. And note that we are using lighten. I like that. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to do. We just lighten that yellow by a little bit. Maybe two, but one, whatever. And uh, set a color of dark. That's the text color. We also have, if, if you notice here, we've got two different types of fonts. We have the Reuben, but the question itself is Arial. So how do we deal with that? Well, we set a group. A group is like a class. So there we are saying groups. Here is question. In, in a, 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 an object literal like this, the style in Zim is an object literal. In the object literal, we can't start something with a dot like that. So that's out, because we can't start it with a dot, we've grouped them inside of a thing called group. That's not why it's called group, but they are inside of a thing called group. A group is like a class in CSS. We didn't want to call it class here because class is kind of like a keyword and class means a little bit something different to us. Uh, it's like a class that objects are made from. Very similar, a classification. That's what it stands for. In, in CSS, that's why it's called a class. The class of all headings will be, you know, will look like this. So it's not that they chose the wrong word. It's just it means a little more specific thing in our coding world. So we didn't want to call it class here. Instead, we called it group, which is fine. In our groups of tags called headings, or groups of objects called headings, we're, we've got one called questions. These ones up here are all the styles for the Zim objects. So anything that you put in type is for the Zim objects. You can ignore, uh, you can ignore these and just take all this stuff, put it right in the style like so, and end the style. What this would mean is all types of things and all groups of things would, or like all all things would get these styles right here, which may be tricky for you. You know, maybe you don't want all things to get that, but it, it works out quite often. So quite often, if I'm making a style, I'll set the style, I'll make some stuff, and then I'll turn the style off. I'll say, okay, I'm finished with the style. There's a fast way to set the style off like that. You can also use this style.clear. That would turn off the style. And for adding styles to groups and things, you've also got style.addGroup. And that would, uh, you put the group and you put the style in here or whatever your, your styles are, like so. So you've got specific ones. You can remove from groups, add to groups. You can remove from types, add to types. You can just add and remove. So you can use, don't use any of these, uh, any of those things and just only use styles in Zim like that. That's new to Zimcat 1, I think, or maybe Zimcat. I think it's new to Zimcat. Anyway, I still usually prefer to put the styles in the object literal. I've gotten used to that, and it's fairly, fairly easy for me to deal with. There they all are. So let's take a look at that group. So there's how we said the group called question is going to have these styles. And if we look at page one, here's a label. The text of the label is that, and the group this belongs to is question. And you can put multiple groups in there with a comma. So this label belongs to the group called question, and therefore it's going to have a font of Arial. This label right here belongs to that group of question, and it gets a font of Arial as well. So that's why all the questions look like that. Okay, so that's uh, the styling. What haven't we seen? We have not actually seen where the data goes. But is there anything else in the bind that we can look at? We're not in the bind in the, in the code here. We've taken a look at the bindings. I thought I saw a, not a bind, but um, it's like a wire. Did I see a wire in here? There's a wire. Oh, the indicator's wired. Let's see what we've done with that. So the indicator's down there at the bottom, and we've said that the indicator is going to be wired by pages. So when we change the pages, uh, depending on the selected index, that's the property, we're, oh, the input is the index. So in de, uh, the input, hmm, let's see, how does this work? Selected index. 
which one's coming from the pages. Wired is a bit strange for me. Wired is the indicator is wired by something else. Usually I do it the other way around. I say the pages will wire the indicator and then I'm kind of used to how it's sort of like a backwards forwards thing. Anyway, we are running a filter there. Oh, that's kind of cool. We're running a filter. We're receiving the value of this. Let's try and figure out which way this is actually going. The property that uh, we're changing is the selected index. So the, the indicator has a selected index property. That's the property that we're changing. The input, let me move that up to there. there we go. The input is the index. So that means the pages object has an index property, not a selected index, but an index. Why doesn't it have a selected index? Maybe the page, yeah, if you think about it, a page isn't really selected, is it? It's not, we're on it, but I, I wouldn't really call that a selected thing. It's not like a, a slider that has a selected value or you know, whatever. So it's just called index is the property. So whenever the page changes its index, we match that. We wire the selected index property to it. But before we do that, this filter will run. And so here's the filter. We're receiving the value. And then we're going to return. We either return. Um, if the value is greater than 10, we're returning minus 1. So if we return minus 1, it means that... Um, the selected index will be minus one of the indicator, which basically turns the indicator off. Otherwise, we're going to set it to the value. So we're not doing anything. Basically, this filter says if it's greater than 10, turn off the uh, turn off the selected index of the indicator. Otherwise, just use the value. Isn't that cool? So that's an example of a filter that's being used on wired. Bind also has a filter. The difference between wired and bind is wired connects local things to Zim, things that are in Zim, it connects them up and works very similarly. It says, hey, here's the data that I'm wanting to do. Here's the property I'm wanting to do. Please connect that up. And it has filters. It has a callback and all that kind of stuff. Callback happens after the bind, after the wired happens. Bind, however, connects Zim up with a database with data outside of Zim. And that's bind. And we thought of, we made bind first. We thought of making, uh, making wired be bind and just bind internally as well. But uh, we decided to call it a different function and treat it. It, it. It's On the back end, it's almost completely different. We're not sending data back and forth. We're actually, it's, it's more like an event. We're, we're working right inside of the Zim ticker, inside of the Zim ticker and saying, hey, if anything's changing, if that ever changes, then change the value. It's basically what an event has to do as well, except we've We've done it without events. So wired takes the place of events. And this is an example of us wiring. The event is almost just as in the event. We would have put a conditional in the event to find out if we want to change it. So, you know, it's almost the same thing. But there you go. All right. Well, let's see. All we have to do is take a quick peek at the data. And you're going, oh, my goodness. We couldn't possibly do that in the amount of time. We always try and do these Zim Explorers. Uh, within an hour, and we've got three minutes left. <laughs> well, we might go over a little bit, but you can just take a break if you want, grab a cookie. I would love to grab a cookie, but you know it's not going to take us too long to do the data. What we've done is put the PHP right here in this and put some information about what we're doing in there. Uh, it's hard to read, though, when it's commented out like that, so I recommend, as, as we said right up at the top, uh, uncomment this to take a better look. So there we've uncommented it. Here's some PHP. It, it's actually in this file right here. So this is the same stuff. Here's some PHP. We're requiring Zim base. So go take a look at zimjs.com slash base, or you can find out more about that in the code section of Zim. Let me show you where that is. Code section of Zim. Scroll on down. And here it is, right? Uh, so there's libraries. So you're looking for libraries. And there it is right there, ZimBase. So ZimBase uses one third the MySQLi, and you hardly have to think about it. There's an example. 
Uh, oh, this is a picture of an example. But anyway, basically on your database stuff, imagine that. That's one line, one line of code to put some stuff into a database. One line of code. That's it. So you require Zimbase and use one line of code, and that handles certain types of things that you need to do. There's some examples of uh, Zimbases there, but none of these examples is uh, using or shows the recent things. We've added some things to Zimbase. By the way, these are the commands to Zimbase. And we do mention in here just quickly that there's simplify. And that's what we're using in this case. Uh, we can get variables, but if you're getting variables from Zimbind, and if you want to put those variables into different fields, you want to put the variables just in as JSON, which I mentioned works for many things, that's great. You don't have to use this. But if you want to put the variables in as separate fields, then base simplify it, it, it simplifies that. And we've just made that now. So those other three examples didn't do that. This example does that. We probably should add this example to that. Would be a good idea. Here's what it looks like. So we're requiring Zimbase. We're making some data. So we're going to prepare some data to put in there. The data takes the UID and whatever we're receiving as the master. Zimbase knows to check for a master. So that gives us a variable right away. Basically, we don't even have to do anything with our variables coming in. It's all handled by Zimbase. So we've got a master and we're saying the date is going to be now. We're preparing, these are the, the pairs that are usually being passed in in MySQLi to go into the database. So here we are preparing the names of the field and the data. So the name of the field will need a UID in our database. We'll need a date in our database. But the other data that we need to put in is all right in here, base.simplify base.simplify returns an associative array just like that with all of our variables flattened down so we'll end up receiving javascript something like this it starts off as data.javascript.text but simplify will turn that just down into javascript intermediate or advanced that's it so it will turn it, this is how we would normally receive that information. We would have to JSON decode it. So we would JSON decode it. We would have to, you know, grab each one of them and remove this like text thing because we really just want to get the value of that. Anyway, we don't have to do any of that. We simplify it and we're merging this with PHP array underscore merge, our data that we had here. So this is our more like hard-coded stuff that we want. And we're merging in all of that stuff that comes from the Zim uh, survey. So that's it. Then we insert that into the database. Here's, here's what Zimbase does for us in terms of inserting base.insert. This is the name of the table. Pass in our data. Okay, that just saved like, I don't know, five or six lines of complicated uh, binding stuff inside of MySQLi with different types of thing, all that kind of stuff. That's it, isn't that amazing? I love it. That's why we can talk about this in three, three or four minutes. So here it was, five minutes. You know, look at that. So this is our kind of hard-coded stuff, special stuff that we want. This is us just taking a simplified version of all of that data. And uh, then we pass the data and insert it into the database. Zimbase will do more than that. We can select things from the database, and sometimes you need to. You can handle things, complicated things, even right up to record locking stuff. Oh, and it handles all JSON stuff really nicely. Um, here we are checking for affected rows. So did we actually insert something? The affected rows is the MySQLi to find out how many things got changed. If that's if we actually were successful, then we're going to reply. This is nice. A base reply, success, data added. Otherwise, if it's broken, we're going to reply, uh, error cannot store data. That's what we would have received in our error box if, if we actually had an error, but we didn't. So there's the reporting back. If you don't need to report back because you assume it goes in there and it's, it's gone in there every time and it probably will go in there forever. Like, though, I built Dan Zen. I've been working on this since 1995. I built Dan Zen. All of my database work, I hardly ever did any error reporting and I've never really noticed or had any problems. <laughs> but if you really do want to do some error reporting, there it is. It's built into Zimbase as well.
and that that's it for that's it for your data stuff. Um, in this actual one, I think I showed you how we could do that manually. Here's how instead of using simplify, we would do that manually. Uh, I think we'd have to JSON parse our data, but then we could say the JavaScript field would be the data's JavaScript's text, whatever's in that. The Zim field would be the data's Zim text. You see how that's kind of redundant? We don't care about that. If, if these ones are each unique, why do we care which property we were getting from that? So that's when we realized we started by, you know, doing this and we went, okay, wait a minute. It could be easier for submitting to a form. It could be easier. So we made Simplify and we're going to be launching Simplify. Well, it's it's live now if you grab ZimBase, but we'll announce it as we launch ZimCat 3. All right, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? What do you think? I think we've done it. I think that that's been a Zim Explorer. Where, so if you want, you can come on in and take that survey. We would love to see your answers for that. And hopefully you've enjoyed the Explorer. We certainly enjoyed giving it to you. We're very happy to be able to show you how to do a cool looking form like this in Zim. You're welcome to come join us at zimjs.com slash slack and say hello, don't be shy. Come on in, answer the survey too. <laughs> Cheers, I am Dr. Abstract and this has been a Zim Explorer. That's a bubbling, Zim bubbling. That's our other series. Ciao for now.